Is the medical establishment making progress in the fight to cure cancer? Yes and no is the answer. And here to discuss the future of cancer, we have Dr. Craig Thompson. He is CEO of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. That is the world's largest and oldest private institution devoted to cancer prevention, treatment, research, and education. So thank you very much for joining us. We've made a ton of progress in the, the world of fighting cancer, and yet there are still a lot of people out there who, who don't feel that enough is being done for their relatives or themselves. Can you help square that circle? Sure, Simon. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to, to provide some of this information. Over the last 15 years, we've learned a tremendous amount about what causes cancer and how cancer arises in our body in different tissues. We now know that there are over 200 types of cancer. That information doesn't always lead us to a better cure for an individual cancer or for a patient's cancer. And so the frustration is, as we learn a lot, we have to develop new therapies to develop better and more effective ways to exploit this information. And so that's always the frustration for patients and their families, that the information about why they got cancer and what's wrong that's led to cancer comes before our ability to treat it effectively using that information. But it is an important step along the way. Now, for all the mystery about this, there are some very basic things that we can all do. Can you uh, elaborate? Well, sure. One of the things that we've learned since the human genome was sequenced in 2003 is that cancer really isn't uh, a, gene, a disease that we inherit. A small percentage of people inherit a predisposition to cancer, but most of us acquire a, can a risk of cancer because of the exposures we have in our lifetime. Many of them we know. The exposure to tobacco smoke uh, is a carcinogen that damages our DNA and as cells replicate to replace the lining tissue of our lungs and other tissues that are exposed to tobacco smoke, they're damaged and that creates mutations that lead cells to develop into cancers. The same is true of sun exposure. So particularly as we go out and overindulge in sun exposure and get suntanned, uh, as we go at it through a sunburn, we damage those tissues. It's that red tissue that, and the skin that sloughs off as that damaged tissue is replaced by new tissue underneath. But some of the cells remain and they're damaged. And that leads to a chance over our lifetime of developing cancer. So, so, so don't smoke, don't be around people who smoke, right. and, and wear some sunscreen. And what, what about other, uh, other dietary things? So a couple of other things that we, we've come to know about. Certain number of cancers, our, our predisposition is due to viral illnesses. So uh, a lot of people know about the association with cervical cancer in women and HPV. Now more increasingly we know other cancers are associated with this virus and now there are effective vaccines that are being developed. So there are vaccines for certain forms of viruses that predispose us to cancer. Some of the uh, viruses that cause hepatitis are a very common cause of liver cancer in people. So those vaccines make a difference. And increasingly we've discovered as we've started to get people to understand that they shouldn't smoke and they need to control and use sunscreen and they control their sun exposure, we're finding a new cause of environmentally induced cancer, if you will, is coming. And that's the obesity epidemic we're seeing in America. Um, more and more as we overindulge in eating, we're finding one of the risks is an increased incidence of cancer and certain very common forms of cancer. Uh, cancers of our GI tract, the intestines, colon, gastro the breast cancer, yeah. gastrointestinal cancers. And um, we now realize in this, probably in this decade, the obesity epidemic that we're seeing in America, an increase in type 2 diabetes, is leading that to be the number one cause of preventable cancers in America. And so one of the, it's another really important reason to watch your weight, get more exercise, and uh, not overindulge. Not, not, definitely a lot of people not need to overindulge, including me. What about the future of prevention? Because those are the things that we can do, but there's also technologies and treatments that you've been uh, looking into. Right, so one of the most important things is what can more effectively be done in a screening exam to help people recognize that they are predisposed to cancer. So we see the discussions about where mammography might be used most effectively, where colonoscopy could be used more effectively. And increasingly there are new Im newer imaging techniques that should help advance people, particularly those predisposed to certain diseases, such as people that had been heavy smokers and still retain a risk of lung cancer, special x-ray examinations that should be done. Um, now again, those are really been defined mostly for people at risk populations, people that have a higher than normal risk. And so it's something people should discuss with their individual physician uh, to make sure that the examinations that are done to prevent or diagnose cancer earlier are done appropriately for them as an individual. 
Now, you mentioned the smoking, people who had been heavy smokers. The, the, one of the things that we're told a lot is um, if you cut, if you quit smoking, the, the risk of cancer goes down massively, right. uh, very, very quickly, right. like it was that you have never been a smoker after a few years. That's still true, right? It, it is still true, but it takes a number of years. And in, the, in that intervening years, uh, we know as people go through the process of getting themselves off tobacco that we should actually be vigilant during that period of time to make sure an early cancer isn't arising. And so there's a new screening test called a spiral CT that allows us to effectively screen those individuals uh, to make sure that we catch if they, in that intervening time as their risk is going down, do develop lung cancer, we catch it early enough that it can be cured. How does big data play into all of this? Um, you, you analyzing data so we can have specific targeting. So, so one of the really important questions now is how we use this massive amount of information that we're gaining in medicine. One of the most important new sets of information is the understanding of our genetic makeup. And so we inherit um, three billion bits of information from our mom and dad each, and that makes us up as an individual. We didn't find many cures for many diseases when the human genome was sequenced. Cancer is the place, though, over the last 10 years we've learned to exploit that. Because, as I said earlier, we don't inherit a risk of cancer. Actually, cancer arises as we try, every time we divide and make a new cell, every time we replace new tissue, you have a sunburn and new skin is produced. Every cell has to copy that information that we got from mom and dad over again. And copying three billion things in the course of damage, like a sunburn, is a difficult process to do, and there are errors made. And there's some those little, little errors, mistakes. those yeah. little mi yeah. mistakes, could we call mutations. They're somatic mutations, because you're not gonna pass them on to your kids, but they, are, they live in the progeny of that cell that was damaged by, say, sunlight going forward. And that information, what's different about that damaged cell from the cells you, the genes you inherited from mom and dad, give us a clue to what's wrong in a cancer cell and allows us a way to diagnose specifically what arose that made that cell decide to go off and divide all the time rather than take its normal place in the body. And that's led to this new way to exploit cancer information that we call precision medicine. Uh, a way to target specifically the mutations in a cancer. So no longer do we classify cancer just because you have lung cancer, but the specific mutation an individual person has makes more information for us to specifically and safely and effectively treat that disease. You've discovered something like an, called an off switch. Yeah. Explain what that is, because it relates to how you treat things. Right, so one of the most exciting advances of the last few years, it's, it's always been a puzzle to doctors why our immune system, which should look for damaged tissue and should r clear out virally infected cells or damaged cells, such as in sunburn, actually isn't doing our job in fighting what is this devastating disease, cancer, which is causing a destruction throughout the body. And what we've come to appreciate and didn't realize a decade ago is that our immune system not only helps us fight off things that try and invade us, like viruses and bacteria, but as we go to repair the damage from something like sunburn, from smoking damage when you're coughing, the immune system flips a switch that allows the cell to switch, the immune system from destroying tissue that's damaged to helping the remaining tissue repair itself and proliferate better to fix the wound to be able to do that. We hadn't appreciated that role of the immune system. And that ability to switch from fighting foreign things to helping your body recover is now an exploitable part of our cancer armamentarian. Because what we've learned is that by switch, flipping that switch, the immune system no longer recognizes the cancer cells as damaged. And if we can turn that switch back on, so that the immune system continues to recognize the cancer as a harmful thing, we mount a very effective and very personal patient response to their own cancer. So the patient themselves is fighting their cancer. And the new treatments that are called immuno-oncology are actually to assist the patient in curing themselves of their cancer. And, and how, how far away is that? Is that gonna be widespread so people who, who, who get a cancer will say, hey, we, we got this thing, take this, or, or whatever, whatever, whatever the magic is that you use, right. then, and then they're, they're away. These new drugs that, that block the, the switch, the off yeah. switch, uh, that we call drugs that are called checkpoint blockade uh, agents, uh, are starting to be seen effectively in a number of cancers. Initially, we thought they would just be in the cancers that would be associated with, say, sun damage. So they were first used in the most deadly form of skin cancer called melanoma. And in that case, 
20 to 40 percent of people have dramatic effects when we simply turn back on their immune system and the immune system's ability to fight cancer. With the newer generations, as we've come to know more and more, the, the off switch, just as everything in our body is more complicated than one simple switch, as we learn that there are other ways in which the immune system plays this interaction in helping versus uh, damaging cancer cells, the new generation of drugs that's just been announced actually has a much wider spectrum. So there's been success now in lung cancer, in stomach cancer, and bladder cancer. Many different cancers seem to advantage. We're just learning the full range of how this ability to reharness the power of our immune system can be used effectively to fight cancer. One of the things you say is that cancer isn't one disease. Is that, is that part of the reason it's so tricky to, to, to really have one solution? Well, I think that's, that's been the, the real frustration for patients and their families. Um, we tend to think of the tremendous success, success that's been made in certain diseases like heart disease. But heart disease is, is primarily one primary disease in which the blood vessels that supply oxygen to the heart just don't work effectively enough. And there are various corrective actions that we can take. In cancer, it can arise in any tissue in our body. And every tissue has a unique set of genes that are used by that tissue to maintain itself. And so cancer, since it arises in these different organs of our body, comes in almost 200 to 300 different, different types. And each type arises uniquely because of a variety of environmental exposures. The cell type itself has a specific set of properties, and we need to understand both of those if we're most effectively going to fight for that patient, the cancer, and to develop an effective remedy that is safe and gives hope to actually curing cancer. And that's what we need, hope. Thank you very much.